everybody, and welcome to the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where poetry meets podcast. It's very, very simple. This might be the simplest thing I've ever done. But before we get into Piao Du of Matthew Buckley Smith's interview. I need to do a bunch of the housekeeping stuff, guys. Housekeeping? First off, before you're even allowed to hear anything, you need to rate this show. Go over to iTunes or wherever you're listening to it and give it whatever the top score is. If it's five stars, if it's 100%, If it's 16 cows, whatever it is, do the thing. Do what's right. Do what you know you want to do deep down. And if you could, if you will, you need to find yourself a friend and tell them how fucking awesome this is. While you're out and about today, think to yourself... I should tell somebody about this podcast. And then when you see that person who would be susceptible to that kind of inspiration from you, beseech it. If that is even what that word means, do that. Do that to them. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Um, Also, it's time for... The shout outs. The shout outs. So I want to thank those over at Patreon. Uh, Michael, Cedar, Harry, thank you so much. If you didn't hear your name, your card got declined. Fix it. And then for those of you who support me over on the tubes, on the YouTube, I want to give a big thank you to AM, to Patrick, and to Alan. For kicking ass and taking names and helping me out, helping the show happen. And now, for those big swinging dicks over at the Anarchy Crew, let's give a big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Thomas, to Tim, to Lisa, and to Josh. Thank you guys so much for doing this and keeping the show together. And don't think I forgot Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are what makes me get out of bed every morning. Because without you, I would just try to do all of this from bed. And we all know how that would work. Quite shoddily. I do want to make an announcement here. Some of you might have noticed in the first part of this interview with Bucks... He sounded amazing, and I sounded like I was giving oral sex to a vacuum cleaner. And that's fine, you know, no one's no one's throwing rocks at glass houses here, you know, whatever, it's okay. But I do want you guys to know that the reason for this is that the legend, the influencer, the poetry critic extraordinaire slash amazing poet Matthew Buckley Smith because of his standing in the poetry podcast internet community that motherfucker has a big ass microphone and it's nice and it's got guards on it it's got all sorts of gadgets and gizmos and wires and shit coming off of it and then he has these really nice fancy headphones you know and if you don't believe me and you want to be able to see the video version of this podcast and every other podcast all you have to do is click the join button on my youtube page and join the crew And you can see this so you know I'm not lying to you because I would not do that to you because I think too much of you to fill your head full of lies. So anyway, 
Bucks has this wonderful setup that makes him sound like a motherfucking god. And I am just screaming at my laptop. And because of this, whenever he talks, my computer's like, I actually don't want to listen to you, Mr. Matt Wall. Matthew Buckley Smith has a much clearer and soothing voice than you do. So shut the fuck up and let's let Bucks talk. And I'm like, no, this is my show, you stupid fucking laptop. You do what I say. And then my laptop says, why don't you get some fucking good equipment so you don't sound like a putz? And I'm like, whoa, what's with the fucking name calling, Mr. Laptop? I thought we were friends. I thought you were my therapist. What the fuck? And my laptop's like, no, no, no. Get good equipment or stop having guests. That's it. Because if your guests show up with some big ass fucking microphone, you're going to look like a dumbass. And so now me and my laptop here are at an impasse. I don't know what to do. And if it sounds like people are shooting at me, that's my radiator. Because it's getting chilly. Because here in Southern California, it goes from summer to fall to winter really fast. And it's getting chilly. And so my heater's on. The heater's not even on, actually. That's just the pipes. That's the noise of a radiator in a building that was built in 1929. So with all that said, let's get to what you are going to be hearing about today. Am I right, guys? So on this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where poetry meets meat in a carnivore frenzy of art, sure, whatever, me and Matthew Buckley Smith are going to talk about what makes poets embarrassing. And is there a difference between an embarrassing poet and an embarrassing poem? We're also going to talk about the common number of books that are put out by a publisher when you get a poetry book. We're going to talk at some great length about the legendary Rod McEwen, however you feel about that. We're going to talk about what makes a poetry reading exciting. What makes people want to even go to a poetry reading? Who the fuck would want to do that? We're going to talk a little bit, too, about the Poetry Says Poetry podcast and the wild and crazy Australian poetry scene. Very briefly. And then we are going to discuss if poetry is a business or a virtuous practice. We will talk about, can poets even fucking be entertaining? Do they know how? And what is the publisher's role in poetry readings? We're going to talk about poetry tours. We're going to talk about if traditional poetry publishers are dying. And then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about Slee Ricketts. You know, the podcast that social influencer Matthew Buckley Smith hosts. And The Secret Show, which is his paywall show. And which show is better? And which show I like better? And which show you should like better? This is action-packed. It's fucking riveting. And those are two descriptions that you will never hear when it comes to poetry podcasts. So buckle up, get the lube, and enjoy yourself. Because now I'm going to talk again to Matthew Buckley Smith. There's been a couple times when you have talked about why are poets embarrassing? <laughs> yeah. Like, What makes a poet yeah. embarrassing? Uh, I think partly it's caring about something so much that not only do other people not care about, if you like cradle your child and you like make baby faces at it and you tickle it and you like hold it carefully and you feed it, you know, like some guy on the street doesn't care about your child, but he's also like, well, that's a pretty normal thing. Like a guy mm -hmm. loving his child. If you like cuddle and baby your dog in the same way, you know, people might raise a little more of an eyebrow. Uh, 
But I think like if you as a grown man were doing that with like a rag doll, then people would say, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Like, it's not just that I don't care about it. Cause like, I don't care about your dog or your kid either, but like, what is wrong with you that you care so much about this shit? And I think that's sort of poetry. Like, I think that's what, like, it's not just that poetry doesn't matter to other people. It's that it doesn't seem obvious why it could matter to us. So is there a difference between an embarrassing poet and an embarrassing poem? Yeah. So uh, what would make a poem embarrassing then? I think, well, what makes it embarrassing is that it reveals something about the poet, right? Like it reveals more about the poet than he, it reveals, I mean, especially if it reveals something that he doesn't, that it, it it doesn't seem like he's trying to reveal about himself. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I think that that's like, I mean, that's like a, like a standard trope of like comedy everywhere. Like if you, you're telling all of us something about yourself, especially when you're doing it proudly and declaiming it in a breathy voice. And like, you are the only one who doesn't see that your fly is open. Right. Yeah. For real. And that like you opened it thinking that it was not your fly and that like it wasn't your dick flopping around. Like it like it's so much self exposure and so much embarrassment that that you also have totally the wrong attitude toward. Like your attitude is one of like cradling a precious child. I get that, I get that. Do you know how many um copies were made of the first book? I thought it was five hundred. Is that a pretty solid number? It's a pretty common number for books yeah. of poetry, I think. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Like between five and eight hundred if you are like huge and not huge, but if they think it's going to sell like hotcakes kind of thing. Like eight hundred yeah. hotcakes level. That sounds right. I mean I'm not I'm not up on I'm not up on the details of all that, but yeah, I the numbers are are, uh, are comically low. And then on just another note, just because it popped in my head right now, did you read the article in um, Slade about Rod McEwen? Yes, I did. Oh my God, that's so yeah, cool. I love that. Okay. What yeah, yeah, the Dan Coase article. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wonder because I I actually knew about Rod McEwen because I had a teacher who was old enough to like know of him and despise him and so like brought in examples of his poems just to make fun of them in class when i was a freshman yeah uh, so that was great yeah i mean he's you know uh in in retrospect like the way dan coas describes him he is you know he seems a little bit closer to like a like an influencer poet like we have today yeah. in some ways like it was there was definitely a um what was what was a great line that coas had for it like a uh like a mellow horniness. Like there was some, like he, he had this vibe that he was sort of selling that people got excited about. And they like, he was sort of photogenic and he, and people kind of were excited about, like he was both like writing, uh, music to have sex by, or like poems to have sex by. Yeah. Uh, but also mm -hmm. there were like, people were attracted to the, to the mood and the persona and he would give sold out readings. And so, you know, like as a cultural artifact, it just found it sort of, fascinating like Coase's question I think well I just, he didn't write it but like the I think the the deck line for the article was something like uh millions of people you know read these poems why you know where is he today or where where you know why does no one read him today and it sounds like the, the like the two-part answer is like well obviously the poems were not very good and so like there's not a lot of staying power to that like they don't they don't win a new audience and then but like a lot of people it sounds like still really love him like he's still like the music of their youth like the, like a lot of people sort of they they don't they don't go out and talk about it in public but like they they feel fondly toward him and that like, seemed like i don't nice. know any of the shit before like all of his hustling and all that shit mm, like, yeah, yeah, i didn't yeah. know any of that yeah and so that was like fascinating as fuck yeah, but i also yeah. didn't know that like for the most part, the AIDS scare kind yeah. of made him a, a recluse, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you think if he, okay, this is stupid, but if AIDS hadn't been a thing, do you think <laughs> he would have like kept doing the shit and kept like, like hustling and shit? Because it seemed like the reason why he 
got how we got was because of how hard he pushed. You know? Yeah. I mean, it seems like there were a lot of elements in play. Like he, he was, he was watering down his brand. Like he was spreading himself thin. He was like selling everything. Like mm -hmm. he was putting his name on, on tons of stuff in a kind of an almost ridiculous way. Yeah. Uh, and, and like he was a big phenomenon and like those don't last that long. And like part, especially when they are made, when so much of what makes them up is like the chemistry of the moment. Because again, like there's not that much substance to the writing. Yeah. But like in that context spoken by him in that moment in time, it, it sort of it touched something it touched a nerve for people and it, it was part of the zeitgeist and like that was great for him but yeah like that's that could never last so i think like maybe it would have lasted longer than if he hadn't been such a recluse at that point but i don't know but do you i think don't think i don't think like i don't i don't i don't think about i don't think about like what could have been for rod McEwen. like <laughs> it's like like it's a, like it's unbelievable that he was as successful as he was no, so I'm like wondering you know. if the whole aids thing was an excuse as to why he fell out of favor oh. or if it was legit like he went into hiding because like his whole world changed and he was terrified yeah i mean if you talk to people who were in like i, I know people who were in the theater world during that span and like you just see so many people you know die and mm -hmm. like pretty fucking quickly in a way like my old landlord, um, not landlord, my old um, super uh, in Baltimore talked about, she worked in theater um, back in the day and she talked about just going to the services for the, the latest dead person and seeing like, seeing some guy with a, um, with a, a sore covered up with makeup on his face and just you know, think like, oh, all right, he's next. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine what that would do to you. And the, if that drove him into hiding, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, if he also, do you think like Dan Coas was using it as an excuse or like who was like? Well, I, cause, cause most of the stuff he was talking about was from the guy who got the tapes, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Who was his biographer? Who was sort of his like, yeah. His, so if his that like person, last fanboy standing. Yeah. And if that person had talked to the boyfriend slash half brother, right. you know, like and that was the information that they got because i don't think um the author of the article made that assumption on their own no he didn't didn't seem to yeah i mean the biographer who is also the collector who is like pays rent on the fucking storage for these tapes that he can't even use i mean that's a labor of love like this guy is devoted yeah. to something about rod McEwen. like something about him is magical to him so like, yeah i, I I could imagine both things could be true. Like, yeah, that could legitimately drive him out of the public eye, but also maybe other people in retrospect look back and they say like, well, that's that maybe that's one thing, one reason things came to an end. And um, do you think the um, comparison to Rupi is a good one? I mean, without having read like that much <laughs> of either their poetry, like it, it seems it's pretty fair, one. like her, She's like what I've read of her. I mean, she seems to be somebody who like people have a strong sentimental attachment to her. Part of what they're responding, like a lot of what they're responding to is this persona that mm -hmm. she presents, which I don't think is fake. I just think like that's part of what she's doing. And the poems are, uh, it's something like I, I've said to my brother, who's a visual artist and, and like uh, talking to people about book covers is that like the tricky thing with a book cover is that you don't want it to do too much work. You want it to be a little bit incomplete because yeah. it's got words on it. And those words need to stand in tension with the image in a way that is then together they feel satisfying. Yeah. And I think with with Rupi, Rupi Kaur as with Rod McEwen, part of what you have is, I mean, he had he also used a lot of music and he, he had sort of theatrics and he had all these other tricks. But like with her, you have a persona, you have images of her, as well as these little doodles that she does. You have the whole feeling of like, she's posting this on Instagram and everybody's taking part in this together. And you see all the numbers of people responding to like, all of those are elements that are working in concert with these few little words. Yeah. And so when those all come together, there's a certain chemistry that, that makes mean something to some people. You know, my practice for the most part is just to look at the words, 
it's the same thing I do with a lot of spoken words. I think like, unless I'm listening to music and then I'm really just listening to the music for music's sake, I try to look at the words. And when I look at just the words by themselves, there is, there's not much there, but yeah, like a lot of, a lot of factors are working together and people respond to it. And then like that there, that other people are responding to it reinforces that response. Like, oh, I'm part of a community. Like people get this together. Like we're, we're, we have something in common. And that's, that's a nice feeling. Hmm. Um, I don't know if this is big where you're at, but over here in LA and all this shit, um, something that is very popular, it seems, is people doing, I guess it's kind of spoken word, but they film mm -hmm. it like it's a movie or like a short film and they act out the things that their poetry is saying and like they look around corners and see people standing off to the side and but like i mean here too like you have so many fucking out of work actors you know what i'm saying and like any way that they can get that's how i see it that any way they right. can get in front of the camera show that they could also write and act and do all this shit and it's very i don't even know what the fuck you call it it's like um visual poetry or so i don't fucking know but like so do you not have that over there really i have not i have not seen that yet i mean it makes me sad in several different dimensions but okay. I, you know like <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why not make a short film? Like, why not make a, you know, just make a little vignette, make a little five a minute music you know? video if you're going to yeah. be, you know, right. yeah. but yeah. Like, so I don't, like, I don't know, like when I hear you talk about readings, yeah. I'm like, wow, that's great that they have all these fucking just like page poet fucking readings Yeah, yeah. And out here. There's probably like three places that do readings a lot. And it's mainly like spoken word slam or some kind of variation of this. I mean, there, I wouldn't say there's like lots of readings. It's like I live in a like a sort of a college town. So there's a, a fair number. Yeah. But uh, but also they're not that great. Like most page poets are not very good at performing. And so though I find most spoken word poetry on the terms of the words to be not very exciting, not very interesting. Most spoken word poets, just by virtue of having a lot more practice, are better at getting up on stage and performing. Yeah. So I can understand why that would be. I mean, I'm assuming that some of these places are drawing a crowd. Um, like, there's this one place called, De, is it the Poet? The Poet? I, I can't remember what it's called. But they have this cool little amphitheater room, and it looks like there's always, like a couple hundred people in there and they do Ooh. it like every week and i'm guessing they sell drinks i don't think they do but they sell tickets well everything's non-profit like everything's like a non-profit uh well it's non-profit but they gotta i mean non-profits still sell tickets to things because they're because they're always drowning you know, non-profits always like like climbing up a hill of sand uh that's i mean that kind of blows my mind but like, again like page poetry readings are like less than nothing, like less than no event. Like, so it's not, you know, it's well, really just thing, something. Yeah. One thing you had somebody on who said something like, um, poets should take acting lessons or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I totally don't agree with that just because <laughs> I've seen people act. And when <laughs> someone is acting, you can usually tell they're acting, which means what right. they're saying is not genuine and they look fucking ridiculous. But I do also understand the difference between a stage actor and a theater or a screen actor. Like a, a stage yeah. actor can command a room. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I do get that in the sense, but I don't know. Maybe it's just being in the land of many bad actors right uh, it's like it's like you are mediocre at poetry but what if we gave you a new skill to be bad at and then you can <laughs> you could combine them <laughs> yeah I, i'm kind of i mean i'm kind of with you there i do think like yeah the, the 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 main thing if you were to and i don't know i don't know if i would across the board say like uh, poets need to take acting lessons I, I think like the the main thing you would want them to learn is how to like stand up and deliver lines and have them be audible in a room 
Yeah. You know. Uh, well, I definitely wouldn't say like go take a film acting class. That would be horrible. It'd be terrible yeah. advice. Well, I think too, like with readings, if um, if people can like really learn how to be themselves in a situation like that, and be able to on the in between times, be able to just like kind of shoot the shit with like the people in the front row kind of yeah, thing, yeah, yeah. yeah, and like just make it more of a like chummy event you know like i think that would fucking help so much dude i just yeah well, th- i mean this is like most people i know and this is like it's almost a universal experience for people who've gone to poetry readings is that the best part is the patter yeah like the best part is that you know shooting the shit between poems and as a number of people who've written articles about this have pointed out it is always a sort of uncanny moment when you go from, yeah. So this is the you know this this is this is a little funny thing I wrote with a friend of mine the other day, but um, uh, you might like him. I had to kick their. Li- you think like, oh no, why are you talking like that suddenly? Like why are you just talking like a normal person a minute ago? So I, I think that uh, yeah it, it yeah p- patter definitely helps. Not having any patter tends to be a bad thing, but yeah. it's not the like it's not I don't know. There's I don't know what the solution is. Yeah, I don't know if there is one. I th- well, I think I think part of it is just like go like let there be an expectation that you're supposed to enjoy this. Yeah. And then I think poets can find lots of different solutions. Like poets so you know, you some poets are going to be funny, some are going to be dramatic. Like whatever it is, like you need to go in there saying like I need to show them a good time and not just because I'm a genius well, and they're grateful say, to be there, you know. Do you think they that most poets take themselves too seriously to be able to fucking have a personality when they're in front of a room. Not, not necessarily. I mean, I think, I think it's hard to talk in front of a room and even like what feels like a natural way. I think most people, when they get up in front of a room, in some ways, like the natural reaction is to get real stiff and weird. Um, Cause it is nerve wracking. Like it takes practice and some people are not suited to it. I, I think most poets I know are very self deprecating, but they're just, I mean, it's the way of thinking I know I have had and, and had for a long time with portrait readings, which is like, well, I guess this is the thing that we do. And, you know, like the joke in DC theaters was like, many theaters have been uh, have been um, established in this city before, but none of them yet was established by me. And I think like often when you do a reading, you think like, well, all those other readings were boring as shit, but this time it's me. <laughs> like, and that's like, it's so great when it's me. Uh, I, you know, I, I just think like if you're going to give readings, you need to, you need to like be honest with yourself and say, I want to try to engage the audience in some way. It could be any number of ways. You could lots of different solutions, lots of different strategies. They're different kinds of poets, but like, it, it's not automatic. If you just get up there and you read your poetry audibly, that's not like my old form teacher. He used to say, you get no points for doing it right. Like just if you go up there and you do it right, if you like read your poems and they're audible, that's zero points. That's just not like falling on your ass. Yeah. You have to add some, you have to bring something to make it engrossing. And you, and part of that might be write better poems. Do you think that in your experience of poetry readings that you've been to, are the people going there because they already know the work of the poets or are they going there because, oh, it's a poetry reading and so I'm supposed to go to this thing? I think almost always they, they have some connection to one or the other of the poets or it's established by an institution and they're going because they're part of this. Inst- I mean, I think the number of poetry readings people go to where they just think, oh, there's a poetry reading? I'd love to go to that. I just think that's almost, I think that's vanishingly rare. So it is the poets who are putting the asses in the seats then. Uh, yeah. I mean, the way you say that, it sounds like there are a lot more people than there tend to be. Like, I mean, putting asses in seats is like, sounds like an accomplishment. And I would say like, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. It's more like, <laughs> it's more like, like, oh, I know your wife. <laughs> like it's not it's, it's so not it's like not i'm such a fan people, it's not that i know your work it's that i know your wife yeah i think that's often what's happening and some in what in some way or another now there are like alice talks about a <clears throat> crazy australian poetry scene which i still just it feels like so totally exotic 
Um, if you don't, by the way, I have to plug Alice, uh, Alice Allen, her great podcast poetry says she also is a host on, on sleeve rickets, but she is the best. She's, uh, as like as as I talk to Brian about all the time, like of all the different like people who've come into, like who've met each other and cross paths with each other through the show, like the one thing everybody agrees on is like Alice is the best. Um, but like she talks about these poetry readings in Australia that sound like like they're an event, like they're like a fun party people go to. For real, I, I don't. I mean, that I knew. I, I guess I went like there was something a little it bit sounds, like that. It sounds I saw once, weird, but, like, I, but like in Baltimore, it's a little bit like I saw a little bit of a version of that, but it's but not the way she's describing it. Yeah. When she talks about it, it sounds like the old punk scene, you know, yeah. where all the all the bands would go to whatever band show was playing, kind of thing, and yeah. they would all yeah, hang yeah, out yeah. together afterwards and party together and the whole fucking thing, and it was more of a community than it was like, come look at this thing I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also, I, I don't know. I wonder, I get the, I, if I had to guess, I would guess that there's a there's a an element of it that is, uh, that's like, it's a, it's a place to meet people to have sex with. Yeah. Like in some capacity, you know, like, which, which is like much of what most like social events and like cool things people go to are, are. but I think yeah, like, like, I think that's, that's scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like the scene, right? Yeah. Uh, it's just that the, in this case, they don't get, it's not in the bathroom. Um, yeah. uh, or maybe it is, I don't know. I uh, yeah, I, I think, but like, even if it's even there, there's something like, there's at least some uh, like atmosphere of festivity. There's like, people are, I just think that I think most poets don't bother to do the work to say like, Oh, should I, how should I, should I entertain the audience? Yeah, it's just not it, a thought that crosses it, people's it minds. It has to do also with the fact that the poet isn't looking at the event as something that they should be promoting. Like do po poets, like do poets act like I'm doing a poetry reading and there will be people there because I told a bunch of my friends and neighbors, right? Or are they like, oh, I have fans who like my shit and they will show up. I mean, I don't know many poets who have that kind of denial. I mean, I think like, like I have fans and they will show up automatically. Like that's, I just think like that's not true. automatically, but like if you like do, because it seems like poetry readings is the only real literature based thing where you can go and sell tickets like you would if you were playing a show or if you had a movie premiere or something like that. You know what I'm saying? I've never, I've never been to a poetry reading that sold tickets. I mean, the, the, I get like I've been to poetry readings at conferences where you had to sign up for the conference, but yeah. I've never been to a poetry reading that was an event that sold tickets for that event. Oh, huh. so I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the, presumably the same principles would apply as when you like have a band and you. You have to like if you bring in a certain crowd, then you get a percentage of the like that that like kind of basic head or something like right that. that basic model could could apply. It's just so hard to imagine. Because is it hard to imagine because the poets don't think of themselves like that? Why? Well, I, I mean, again, like who's selling tickets? Like I don't the venue or the poet because if it like depending on what city you're in and how they do shows and stuff like that. Like sometimes like when you like play in Hollywood, <clears throat> the venue gives you like 200 tickets and they're like, sell these tickets. And if you sell all these tickets, um, you get a cut of what we make. And if you don't sell the tickets, you have to pay us for the tickets that you didn't sell. Right. Uh, that would be tough. For points. <laughs> Just think like but here's the whole thing like i i feel like one of the weaknesses in poetry is that poets don't look at it as a business i, I agree every I agree. other entertainment thing is it's an entertainment business yeah no i I, I, to I totally agree with that i totally agree with that i think that like part of the reason it like and that's part of the trouble is that it has this air of being a sort of like a virtuous practice mm -hmm. and so we don't like that it's, it's part like the same reason that we don't that we're not we don't bother to be entertaining at readings is 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 the reason that we oh the same okay so the reason that we are 
that we don't bother to make ourselves entertaining at readings is I think the same reason that we talk about poetry in such nicey, nicey kid glove terms because mm -hmm. we're treating it like it's not something we do for fun. Like it's not a kind of entertainment. Like it's certainly not a business. It's a, almost like a religious practice or uh, a, a totem or um, ideal that we, like I, I, I had a conversation with these two nice ladies at this conference where they, we were talking about, I was, we were talking about like the guy I introduced at the, at the reading and, uh, and he, I mean, or the, um, he, I introduced uh, David Yazzie and we were talking about his, his poetry, which is great. But then they, they said something like, one of them said like, oh, I think we're all grateful for poetry uh, everywhere in our lives. And I just said like, what, what are you talking about? Like, what, what is that? And I think like in fairness to her, she, it was like, she was almost just running on automatic. Like she's just yeah. saying like, we kind of had gotten to that. We got into that like point in the conversation where we all sort of simultaneously went, ah. and she just like threw that on like a button. We're all grateful for poetry. It's just like, yeah. it's the way we talk about it, but it's, it only, it doesn't make it, it doesn't ever make it any better. So how do publishers <laughs> handle poetry readings? <laughs> they don't for the most part. I don't know. That's, that's I mean, like, again, what I'm saying, like, I don't understand why they're not putting the same amount of effort into live events that a record label would do for their bands. It may be a different story in major population centers. I just think like in a, I live in a small town. What do we have? Like 20,000 people. Um, I mean, in there, like you can get university kids for certain things, but like it just, I just don't know that you could get that many people and and i also think that partly because of the way we treat poetry most people if you approach them with a random like if you're if you're walking out on the street and some guy comes up to you and says hey man my, my truck broke down just around the corner and i you know my my wife and my kid are waiting in there and i really need a, you know uh, i by this fluke i lost my wallet and i just i need a little bit of gas so i can get them home uh, can you can you help me out you know you might help them out, you might not, but like you're thinking to yourself, this is a lie. Like this is a very standard panhandling routine I've heard lots of times before. Uh, you know, my inclination is like, if you're having to go through this routine, you probably need this more than I do. But like, I don't believe him. Like, I don't yeah. think that's a true story. And I think with most people come up to you on the street and they say, hey man, there's going to be this poetry reading later. It's going to be really good. Like the same reaction. Like, it's not that that's inconceivable. It's not that that couldn't be true. It's but, just that it's almost certainly not true. But the reason why it's being sold like that makes it untrue. Because if someone were to say to you, instead of, hey, do you want to go to this poetry reading? It's going to be really cool. If they said, hey, do you want to go see Rod McEwen's fucking poetry? <laughs> you know, Holy like, it's going to be yeah. off the chain. But because like, no one is like, I can't even say her last name. What is it? Is it Rupi Cower? I don't know. I've okay, seen it in print. So yeah, he's the fucking rock star. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tree or whatever. Yeah, if, but I mean, like, are you saying like, why are we not selling tickets to Rupi Kaur concerts? Because like, yeah, no, we no, could no, do no, that. No, no, no. no but it's like... why don't poets? I feel like poetry poets feel like okay. I wrote a poem. Someone discover me. Give yeah, me yeah, yeah. all of. It's like what the fuck is that? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh... The way the world is right now with all of the social media with the ways to publish with the ways to do anything anyone could do anything and get their work in front of a million fucking people at any fucking time and it's never been like this like in the last 20 years like all throughout time like poets would have fucking killed somebody to have this ability to fucking do this you're saying that like you two were having like just anything like just yeah. all of the different ways that you could reach an audience and i feel yeah. like poetry does not want to try to reach that audience and then when insta poets do it they make fun of them for it and then it's like oh well i'm going to do the exact opposite of that and not tell anyone ever that i've ever <laughs> wrote a poem it's like what the yeah, fuck yeah. is that i mean i think i think it's sort of a problem for like artists at large right is that there's there's the making the art and then there's the promoting it and they're just different things and some people have an appetite for one and not the other. Some people have a knack for one and not the other. Some people have the 
the inclination to do one and that, not the other. Like I think because nobody is making a living off poetry, not nobody, but because for the most part, the expectation is you're not going to make a living off poetry and like you're not even going to get respected for it. Uh, then people don't, people who, I mean, I think a lot of people treat poetry as a, as a thing they do for them selves it's like either i think like a lot of normal people treat poetry as just like a kind of a form of therapy which is fine um and then and then a lot of like serious page poet poets um treat it as a a thing they are happy only to share with the small group of people that they already know basically i have just decided i'm gonna go on tour okay i'm gonna do this and see how much of a fucking train wreck it's going to be all right and what's the how does that work what's that i mean do you know like do you know you, you have like certain cities where you know you've got a, a little bit of a base or well i have cities where i know i know people but right. i also have venues and shit that i've booked at and played at before going right because you've because you've done music tours yeah so you're gonna do this is this gonna be straight poetry straight tour? Poetry. okay all right but but i will say like the 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 like conventional poetry avenues or sorry conventional publishing avenues for poetry certainly are like losing their reputation like like i think we are ready for something to turn there yeah and like rod like rod McEwen, you know part of what was interesting in that story is like his first book was self-published uh and so I, I i definitely think that like there is still among certain circles a an air of legitimacy that is conferred by having a like a traditional press run your book rather than a self self publishing it and i totally confess it like i i i am a hundred percent vulnerable to that like i totally feel that uh but i think that it's increasingly implausible like i think i think conventional presses are, are sort of losing their credibility yeah i did kind of say, like i was telling a friend of mine jonathan that he should start a podcast he goes he had a poetry podcast a while ago and i liked it and it it was scuttled after like four episodes farmer? And i've been telling him for a while jonathan farmer yeah I was telling him before, like, hey, you need to start another podcast, you, need to, you know, and and uh, I kind of like I kept wanting something to exist. And then finally, I said, like, all right, I guess I need to do it. And it was more work than I thought it would be. But uh, but yeah, like I I'm doing something like I did my part. I mean, you're you, the thing is, like, you just do you have an endless stamina, like you do so many different things. So I, I don't I, I can't pretend to understand that. But but I've done my, I've contributed to my, to, I've done my, my bit for poetry citizenship uh, with Slee Ricketts. And that's, that's all I got for now. And that's, that's a great amount of stuff, dude. Seriously. Well, th well, thank you. And thank you so much. I mean, you've been an incredibly uh, um, fun and generous correspondent and listener and everything. So I'm very, oh, I'm very grateful for that. I love it. Oh, and I should say too, since we're still recording, if yeah. you haven't gone and um, subscribed to Slee Ricketts yet, do that. But I'm going to say this here now. The secret show is the paywall show mm -hmm. that you do. And for those of you, if you think you like Slee Ricketts, the, the secret show is even better. And it's kind of <laughs> like if you like this show, you will definitely like the secret show because the secret show is a lot more fun. It's almost like <laughs> gloves off version of Slee Ricketts. So if you don't mind <laughs> my stupidity and my fucking liquor going all crazy all the time. No, no, no. The secret show is definitely where you should go. So can you like yeah. plug all that shit? Yeah, uh, you can Google Slee Ricketts, S-L-E-E-R-I-C-K-E-T-S to find you know, the, the, the webpage is my website, but if you go to sleeverickets.com, it'll, it'll re redirect to my website, go on Apple podcast or whatever service you use and, and give a, I got a, I got a two-star rating recently. It was my first two-star rating. So oh, okay. put it, yeah, throw it through, you know, it's nice to mix things up a little bit. Yeah. Give it a rating, give it a review. Uh, you go to sleeverickets.substack.com for the secret show. If you sign up just for a free subscription, I will give you a week's, uh, access to the secret show. I, my goal is to have enough people sign up for that that I start getting nervous about what I say on there again <laughs> because at the moment I still feel fairly secure talking shit on there. A secret, secret show for higher. Yeah, God, people. God only knows. Yeah, it'll, it'll, we'll, we'll get, yeah, it'll, it'll, uh, be whole, whole new ways to make my, make my wife uh, uneasy about, about this podcast. 
<laughs> well, then the last thing I want to say to you is, um, Matthew. Yes, sir. People may tell you that you don't have a gift for narrative, <laughs> but I'm here, though, here <laughs> to tell you that you do. Oh, I'm. I, that means that means that means a lot. It's a deep deep cut there, uh, and I I'm very grateful. Thank you, sir. And likewise, likewise, you are a, you are a maestro. Oh, perfect. Thank you so right. much. I'm gonna I'm gonna get some very sweaty COVID sleep now. Uh, thank you so much stuff. for having me on. Take your stuff. Thank you so right. much. I'll talk yeah. to you. Thank you. Night, sir. And good folks, that is it. That is the extent of the conversation that I had with social influencer. <laughs> I don't know why I keep fucking saying that. It's so stupid. <laughs> well, that's the end of the conversation I had with Matthew Buckley Smith. Um, and hopefully he will talk to me again um, privately. I don't even care if it's on a podcast. I just, I just hope that he enjoys this enough to continue the conversation. Now is the time for the butt plugs where I tell you everything I'm doing and make you go, God damn, I want to do a little of that. So here we go. Let's get into the plugs. First off, if you go to IHateMattWall.com, you will be able to pick up a free ebook and check this out. I'm going to blow your mind here a little bit. You need to get this book before the end of the year because come January, it's going to be a different book. All right. So the book that's up there now is my 2021 short story and poetry yearbook where it's a collection of everything that I posted on the site during the year of 2021. And it was kind of a cool thing when I started 2022 to have this book that was like a greatest hits of everything I had been doing. But now it's kind of old hat. Nobody gives a shit anymore. So this is the last chance for you to pick up that free tome. And all you have to do is you go to my website, ihatematwall.com. And a box will pop up. It'll say, get a free ebook. All you have to do is write your little email address in there. And in exchange for finding a way to contact you whenever I feel like it, I will give you a free book. And it's this copacetic relationship that we're both having here that we both like a lot. So do that. Also, the Blood Rag issue 5 should be out by the time you hear this. So look for that at my Etsy shop along with my chat books like Last Chance for Gas. Poetry about Last Chance Gas Stations out now. Um, you could also find um, my books on Amazon, the almighty Amazon. There's a lot of my fiction, a lot of my short fiction, and a couple of my poetry paperbacks up there too, if you would like to take a look at those. Um, also on Amazon, we have Horrywood, Confessions of a Low-Budget Horror Filmmaker, which is my Kindle Vela serial. Um, new episodes posted every week. Um, episode 5 is going to go up this week. It'll probably be up by the time you hear this. Actually, that's not true, because I'm going to put this up right now. I forgot all about that. So all that shit I said earlier about Blood Rag, it's lies. It won't be out yet but it should be out next week. Also on Amazon, you can get um, the first two volumes of the Poetic Anarchy Anthologies, um, volume one and volume two. And in November, volume three is gonna come out and volume three has even more poets in it than the previous two. So definitely jump in on that. Um, you could find my music on any streaming service, um, Spotify, YouTube Music, Prime Music, um, Doodle bop, doodle bop. If you want to use my music to um, have on your TikToks and your wackity wicks and your reels, you can do that too. Um, definitely, if you guys have any comments about any of the bullshit I spew out of my mouth here and you want to yell at me, you can send an email to IHateMattWall at gmail.com and I would gladly gladly talk about it on the show and if you are like the millions out there who agree with everything I say and you just want to tell me how awesome I am and how you think I'm great I would love to hear that as well and I would love to tell everyone that you said that same email you know 
So that should be good. If you would like to be a guest on the shit show of the podcast, let me know. Hit me up. Do you have a new book coming out? Do you want to talk poetry? Do you have a theory about something poetic that you would like to get into a sort of debate with me about? Oh, man. Bring it. Let me know. I hate Matt Wall at gmail.com. And... And, and, if you want me to come or do a virtual thing, hey, let's just leave it there. Do you want me to come, guys? If you want me to do um, one of my virtual Poetic Anarchy seminars or just do a self-publishing or poetry Q&A with you or whatever organization you're with, let me know. I'm down to do fun shit. I like doing stuff. And finally, if you would like to um, get into my mentorship program... If you go to IHateMattWall.com slash mentorship, you can find out all about it. Um, yeah, so everything will be super cool and amazing. But finally, Poetic Anarchy. Do you want to join us? Do you want to be a part of the crew? Do you want, probably by the time you hear this, over 100 videos of lessons, live streams, um, the community is growing, and now we have our own Discord server where everyone in the um, Poetic Anarchy crew can chat back and forth and send their poetry back and forth and see what everyone's feeling about it. All of this shit's amazing, and if you want to just try Poetic Anarchy, the first five lessons are up at PoeticAnarchy.com, and you can take it and see if you like it, because it's not for everybody. It should be, but some people are fucking stupid. So check it out if you want to. And other than that, I guess I will just see you guys next time. Yeah, I guess this is it. I guess this is the part where Ferris Bueller comes out of the bathroom and tells us that we need to fucking just leave. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to make like a tree and split. Huh? You like that? You like what I did there? All right, guys, so I will talk to you later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon, I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.